Right, so can I just look around, are there questions? So let's see, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six. Right, we have seven questions I can see. I will start, actually kept starting on this side, so I'm going to this time around start on this side. Yes? Um, I'm Isaac from the Access Campaign, and I'm also from Zimbabwe. So my question is about the presentation on the 1990 uh, uh, assessment that you did. Um, it's impressive, um, or oh, being Zimbabwean, it's impressive that the National HIV program is doing this well. Uh, I wanted to ask about the differences between the MSF supported projects. What is it that MSF is doing differently that you would recommend to the national program to improve in their project to get to the same level as MSF? Okay, thank you. I'll take a few more questions before you respond. Um, right, stick into that side of the room, was it? Yeah, that person. Go ahead. Hi, Kathy Hewison, TB Advisor. So my um, question is to Jay. <laughs> um, Jay, thanks very much for that presentation that uh, showed the results of that study that, that really influenced the change in WHO guidelines. <clears throat> so I'd like to know what you think about the risks of implementing the short regimen in Eastern Europe. In your study, I think less than 30% of people were eligible. There were quite strict inclusion gu guidelines. And also you're quite strict in the follow-up and you had quite a big percentage of patients who were failures. What do you think the risk is of implementing that in programmatic conditions where perhaps the, the excitement of a shorter, cheaper regimen might be overwhelm the um, inclusion and follow-up criteria? Thank you. I'll take two more and then we'll get responses. Yes, right, that, that. Yeah. go ahead. Yes, the person with the mic. Hi. Uh I'm Janet Owsley, I'm with uh, MSF France. This question's for Allison, uh, the study on adolescents. Uh, I wondered if through the different discussions you had about the clinical care and adherence, if there were any discussions of the adolescents' uh, sexuality, especially since the family environment seemed like it had stigma associated with it and uh, uh, what the MSF counseling program did uh, to address that since, I guess, adolescence is a time of emerging sexuality for HIV-positive adolescents. Thank you. Um, one more, yes. The person, can you pass it on to the person in front of you, and then yeah, we'll Hi, get morning. answers and then come back Katie, for more questions. Uh, w, uh, MSF. Um, my question is also for Alison. Um, you mentioned that you were revising the model of um, care currently. Um, for the adolescent uh, uh, HIV program. I wondered if you could talk about what those revised implementation models might include, um, because it's, a, it's really fascinating and really, really important to support adolescents um, to better adhere. And if, if, uh, if you're intending to share some of those um, ideas with other MSF projects uh, across the movement. Um, right, can we have a microphone up here in front? You got one, okay. Um, so we have uh, two questions online. One from the field, um, which is to Jay, um, asking how do we plan to proceed with extending uh, short regimen MDRTB regimes throughout other um, MSF national TB programs that we have to support? Additionally, some countries cite high levels of resistance to canamycin and prothionamide as a reason for not implementing the short regimen. How can we convince them that shorter regimens would still work? And then the second question is from an epidemiologist, so I hope that you'll be able to make this understandable for both epis and non-epis in the audience. Um, did you include patients lost to follow-up in your analysis? If yes, did you perform a sensitivity analysis by excluding them and seeing what the difference would be um, for treatment groups on unsuccessful outcomes? We can expect more loss to follow up patients in the standard 24 months regime as compared to the nine months regime and through a higher rate of death plus failure in the short course as compared to the standard regimen. Did you look at that? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough question to take. Um, right, so, so apologies. I suggest we take uh, some responses. Please keep your answers succinct so that we can take more questions. Um, we ha still have about 15 minutes of discussion time. So I'll start with the 1990 question. Okay, so thank you for the question. Um, unfortunately, um, 
I can have an answer, but I think I'm not the more appropriate person to answer to that. And um, I don't know if uh, I can uh, let the parole of somebody who is here who knows better the settings than me and to answer to this question, if it's possible. There is Ellen who is here. And uh, if she doesn't mind to answer for me, uh, I think she will be uh, more adequate. Of the room. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Norwin. Thanks for presenting it. It's really exciting. And I just want to say a big thank to both the field teams there because they've been working so hard in those projects. Um, regarding testing, um, um, one of the things in GUTU they've been doing for the last two, three years is night testing. So going out um, once a week to a kind of hot spots so in terms of attracting men, although we still see uh, lower rates of testing in men. And I'd say MSF is supporting more campaigns in GUTU than probably you know, other national settings. In terms of ART, I think what's different is the differentiated models of care that are going on in GUTU in terms of keeping people in treatment, so the community ART clubs, fast track, and so on. What I think is interesting is we don't see better virological suppression, despite we think we're investing a lot in counselling and have made sure that primary counsellors are in most clinics and are trained and so on. So I think that is quite interesting that really we're not seeing that uh, impact on the virological suppression. Yeah. But you. I think Zimbabwe is, is doing amazingly overall and they're also looking, uh, we have shared those experiences and are looking to um, adopt that at na some of those experiences at national level. Th thank you very much for that. Um, so we have three questions for you, Jay. Yeah. Can you start? Yeah. So um, <laughs> maybe first I'll start with Cathy's question in the room. Um, risks of the short course regimen. Agree. Uh, so I, I think this was the, the background to, to doing the study in Uzbekistan. Um, the the regimen that was described in Bangladesh was spectacularly successful. Um, it was a single arm observational <laughs> study, but 90% uh, relapse free after one year was something new. I think for MDRTB, we'd been having 50 to 60% success rates. So I think everyone was overjoyed at that result, um, and we felt that there was a gap in the knowledge in a country which had high rates of second line drug resistance. So that, that group of patients, as you know, um, had worse outcomes in the Bangladesh cohort. So we wanted to see what effect we could find in Uzbekistan. Um, I think there are challenges. And, and I think when, when we do eventually get to kind of presenting our full data, there, there are some failures in our, in our study. And the question is, how do you manage those failures? Um, so it, uh, MSF, we've, we've got this policy that we're, we're pushing for access to the newer TB drugs, and so we're managing those patients with those newer TB drugs and putting them on longer treatments. Um, do I think it's the short course regimen has a role in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe? Policy at the moment suggests yes. There's still obviously lots of questions about which patients would qualify, exact inclusion criteria, whether first line drug resistance would exclude patients. Um, in our study, we included people with first-line drug resistance, so ethambutol and pyrazinamide resistance, but excluded patients with suspected or, or, or um, confirmed second-line drug resistance. Um, so yeah, I think there are risks. Um, no, no one really knows. Um, and unfortunately, the, the randomized clinical trial does not recruit from countries with very high rates of second-line drug resistance. OK. Um, and the last question. Lost to follow up. Um, so there's a second question about. Lost to uh, follow up. So second question about um, MSF pushing access to the short course regimen in collaborative programs. So to some degree, I think the answer is yes. So for example, in, in Swaziland, where another study was done using the short course regimen in high HIV prevalence setting, uh, MSF is collaborating with the Ministry of Health to, to roll out the short regimen, I believe, nationally. Uh, in Uzbekistan, we're, we're starting to roll out the short regimen in the areas that we're working. Um, further than that, I believe that um, MSF is also uh, conducting a study looking at the short regimen using one of the newer drugs. Um, and we're obviously fielding lots of questions from national TB programs around the uncertainties of very specific drug resistance. Right. And then the last one about the epidemiologists. <laughs> yeah, OK. Um, so. So it, this comes down to the second analysis that we did, looking at end of treatment outcomes. And it, it's a, yeah, I guess it's a little bit confusing, because 
on the one hand, we looked at end of treatment from a 20-month regimen and tried to compare it to end of treatment from a nine-month regimen. So that the patients in the nine-month group, um, when they finish treatment, they're no longer as engaged in healthcare as the people still receiving daily treatment. So the loss to follow-up rates, yes, we did include them in the study. Um, we took quite a conservative approach to loss to follow-up uh, in the sense that in the original protocol, um, we, we looked at microbiological results from end of, end of one year follow-up, uh, which is, is quite difficult. Um, and at the moment, the, the, our, our project team is still trying to find some patients who have moved abroad for work, who, who have moved out of um, the region to see if we can get any kind of clinical follow-up after a year of finishing treatment. Sensitivity analysis, yes, we will be doing that. Um, and also, I think Mathieu's impression is that the short regimen will lead to lower rates of loss to follow-up. Um, you intuitively you think that's going to be correct, but uh, also <coughs> if patients get better quicker um, and treatments are not explained well enough, then you might find that people actually suddenly feel better and go back to work and are lost to follow-up from your program. So it's also a, the pattern of loss to follow-up is something we're looking into. Sure. Thank, thank you. So Alison, if you can respond briefly to those two questions. Sure. I think the first question was um, about whether we looked at issues related to sexuality. I should probably clarify the uh, participants in the study were 10 to 19 years old. The vast majority were paranasia infected. That's not to say that um, we shouldn't have been looking at um, sexuality, but it was somewhat beyond the scope of this particular study. Um, I think it's no clear. One um, I think it's clear from um, the sexual health services that were available and specifically targeted to use in a setting that's perhaps um, a need for more support in that area. So sexuality was beyond the scope of this particular study, but it's um, um, something that was perhaps relevant to a, a, a fairly small proportion of those um, In terms of the revised um, program activities, this is something that the desk and the team in the field are very much working on right now, um, designing that new program and drawing very much on the findings from the qualitative research. Um, it, we know, and they're, they're going to be um, circulating and, and sharing that document, I'm sure, internally and through MSF networks. <clears throat> we know that that um, <clears throat> Excuse me. The focus of those revised activities will be a greater focus, for example, on peer groups, which were very much lacking in this um, this particular setting before. Um, far more interventions at the family level, trying to support households, especially um, caregivers, as well as the adolescents themselves. Um, more focus on good quality adherence counselling, uh, more advocacy for a counselling cadre. Um, and more support to um, counsellors as um, adolescents go through the disclosure process. The, those are the main components that we expect to see in that revised model of care. Th thank you. So we have another five, six minutes. I'll take a limited number of questions, but let me just do a count of how many. So there's one holding the microphone, and there are two more in the middle of the room. Great. So we'll stick to those and then get responses. Go ahead, please. Okay, uh, thank you all for excellent presentations. My name is Menno Schmidt. Uh, I'm a clinical epidemiologist based at the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Um, I, my question is directed to Matthew and Jay. Um, excellent studies. Um, I understand that you potentially took a, a more practical implementation uh, perspective in your research, um, but I was wondering whether you also considered using a randomized design that might have uh, removed some of the limitations and, and helped the policy change process. Thank you for that. Let's go to the next one. Hi, it's Bev Stringer again, and it's a question for um, Alison. Um, I was struck by similarity with results of an adherence study done in Uzbekistan, and Shona Horta is probably in the room. Um, she published that study. And in particular, it was two results that you had, which was linked to control aspects of the treatment approach. Um, where in this particular case, you know, the lack of autonomy that patients felt impacted on uh, their levels of adherence, but also the dialogue, you know, having dialogue ongoing, um, improving dialogue with the health worker was another aspect. And I wonder if through your lit reviews and other knowledge you have about adherence strategies, whether you are seeing similar results across, you know, diseases that require adherence, you know, chronic disease, um, and whether you think then there's a broader impact that could be had where qualitative research is influencing adherence strategies more broadly. 
And then the last one. Yeah, I have uh, a question for Jay. A hundred thousand questions. Can, for can you introduce when, yourself, please? Um, my name is Joost van der Meer. I'm a MSF Holland board member. Um, I'm also evaluating the Gutu project um, for OCB. And I have a question for Alison. Um, Jay, thanks for your interesting presentation. I've also worked in Uzbekistan before, by the way, um, but that's a long time ago. Um, did you look at, in your study, also to the patient experience in terms of side effects, et cetera? And, and if so, could you say something about that? Um, and maybe also, but that was probably not the objective of your study about more qualitative patient experience in, in terms of patient satisfaction. Um, for no end, still on this issue of the third 90, not differing uh, between Gutu and, and, and uh, the rest of the country. Um, I'm really sorry, but if you ask three questions, we will get time for any answers. <laughs> despite this, despite um, the fact that there are real community adherence models in Gutu, which are also in the country, but more intense in the, in the project, can you reflect a bit on what then the difference, why the difference might occur? Okay, thank, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry, but we are running out of time. Great. Um, so should we start with Alison? Um, and I, I very much agree with you. I think those two um, emerging themes around control and limited dialogue is certainly something that we see in many, many other settings, at least in relation to HIV, whether it's adolescents or children. So it's not specific to adolescents. <clears throat> and it's not specific to this setting of rural law. It's, it's very, very typical. Um, I think there probably are lessons um, that can be drawn for um, other uh, diseases as well, particularly TB and the work that Shona did. It definitely speaks to those findings, and I'm sure um, TB adherence in many other settings you know, out, outside Africa. Whether it also speaks to the same dialogues in relation to other illnesses, um, I'm, I'm less familiar with that literature. I, I wouldn't be surprised, and I think it would be something that we, we could perhaps be looking at elsewhere in terms of the dialogues that patients are having with health workers um, in, in relation to other diseases, yeah. Really sorry, Alison, but as a TB epidemiologist, I must interject here. Do we have data to show that um, where we have a more relaxed and auto greater autonomy, that we actually achieve greater adherence? I think some of the practices you showed are outright wrong, but the opposite of that is if we let people do as the adolescents do as they please, would they take their pills? I think it's a very fine line, and I think the, the overarching message is that we have to allow people to have frank and honest discussions so that they don't feel that they have to hide and be um, ashamed and forced into some silence, so that when they can't take their pills, for whatever reason, we know the multitude of barriers, when, those, when they face those barriers, instead of hiding from it, that they can address them and speak frankly and find solutions to them. Sure, thank you. Shall we carry on? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, thanks for the questions. I'll, I'll keep the answers short because we're, we're running out of time. But um, so did we collect side effect data? Yes, um, absolutely. We collected it in a structured way. The, the comparison will be more difficult because in, in regular programs, we, we don't collect kind of, we don't grade side effect um, information as, as much as we would in a study. Um, qualitative study, yeah, we've, we've got a proposal for that. It's on the cards. Um, most of the patients that were involved in, this, in the prospective aspect of this study uh, are still in the region, and we still engage with them through the program. So I think, I think that, that's one method of um, uh, convincing is the wrong word, but um, convince, yeah, convincing programs to suggest that a shorter regimen is, is beneficial for patients and, and kind of their, their lives. Just to add that there are a range of RCTs going on for this exact question, um, and the stream trial would be reporting hopefully very soon on, on the Bangladeshi regimen. Matt, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, I, I think for the, the study in, in Maputo about uh, PLD, I, I don't think there's a need to do a randomized interventional study. I don't think there's actually many scientific questions about the use of PLD for Kaposi's. It's standard of care and has been for decades in developed countries. It's just when you take a little vial that costs $350 and you need two to three vials per round, it's a cost question. So MSF <coughs> negotiated hard and got a lower price per vial and now we're, you know, is hoping to get better access with generic products and cheaper prices to bring it up. So the, the purpose of what we were doing is really as a, as a stepping stone for advocacy and documentation to show what can be done. I don't think there's a scientific question necessarily that needs to be answered. 
Thank you very much for that. So unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, we probably would ha have enough questions to go for the rest of the day in this very exciting session. I'm not going to take the time to summarize each presentation because we've run out of time. But please feel free to catch the speakers during the coffee break and ask your questions. Thank you very much.